Hello again. Oh, wait. <laughs> I'll start with these slides. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final Comp 1511 lecture for Term 1 2021. Feels a little bit like the last day of school, um, where afterwards you just run off and do other things. Although, honestly, I think when's the assignment due <laughs> in... in four hours <laughs> so um so there's there's probably still a bit of work um, that people are going to be doing there's obviously going to be the exam as well um next week there is a bunch of stuff happening um uh the unsw's uh women in tech society along with csc SOC, is running a study session on tuesday afternoon i think it's 2 to 4 p.m on tuesday i'll be coming along to that as well um not sure exactly what i'll be doing but just sort of helping out a little bit. Um, I also want to do a live stream as well, like just a final questions thing. Probably aim for Thursday for that. So then we've got Tuesday and Thursday and there's like sort of group study going on so that people can, can get some help if they need. Um, anyway, let's launch back into it because um, we were doing a speed run <laughs> through 1511 and I started off very badly because I spent more time talking about the exam than the speed run last lecture. But I feel like that was worth it. Um, I feel like uh, people wanted to know about what was going on in the exam, so I think that's something that um, was still of value to people. Um, everyone's saying that uh, they want uh, Chicken to, to say goodbye before the end of the lecture. I will find her before the end of the lecture, and I'll, I'll come in and bring her to say goodbye. Um, she's actually been running around the house like um, in a very, very active state at the moment, so I'll let her keep chasing her little toys around the house and I'll come grab it. I'll come get her later. Okay, so what are we doing? Last lecture we looked at the exam format as I was saying and a little bit of advice on how to approach it and stuff like that. Um, and then we looked at the first part of Comp 1511, but I didn't actually complete the first part of Comp 1511, so we will go back and do that. And then this lecture, we're going to go through everything, so we're going to go cover the rest of the course, like all the technical things, but also in this lecture, we've got the, um, the, the non-technical things that I talked about, the things that are like the... I, I would nearly say the deeper and long-lasting things about programming. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to learn, which is C programming, which may not be that useful to you once you switch to other languages and learn other languages, but it's always really good to get at least a little bit of knowledge about your first language because it's easier to jump to other languages than it is to learn anything from scratch. Um, but a lot of the other skills um, that are the not just pure coding in C skills are the ones that you're going to use in every language like debugging and problem solving and stuff. None of that stuff's ever going to disappear. Um, they're going to be part of um, part of what you do uh, as computing professionals. Even if you don't write any code, you're still going to be doing all that stuff. So um, uh, we'll be going through a little bit of that and a recap of that. So we've got, right now, one hour and 57 minutes to cover 10 weeks worth of work. And let's see how we go with that. So back to where we were. I think that we had looked at variables. I can't remember if we'd gone t gone too far through if statements yet, but here's another meme uh, from people in the course about if statements, and I thought this one was pretty funny as well. Um, just like if they have avocados, get six, and so they got six cartons of milk instead of avocados, you know, funny things like that. So if statements... Question and answer is the way I like to think about these. Um, conditional programming, our ability to turn on or off sections of our code based on questions that we ask. So we had this questions like, is X less than Y? If so, we run what's inside the Kelly brackets, otherwise not. Um, I think people have got the handle on this now, um, I hope, um, but still good to go through everything that we've done. Um, so just remember this format normal brackets and then curly brackets is something we're going to use a lot so it's in if statements it's in while loops um it's even nearly not quite with the brackets but it's also even in stuff like structs as well um and then we get into our looping code um looping code allows us not just to decide whether a section of code runs but we'll go back to the beginning and keep running it again and again and again so when we're looping, we're either going to be doing things to try to um, do repeated tasks until our situation changes. So it's like, keep checking this until this changes, and then we move on to something else. 
or we can say we have a set amount of data and what we're going to do is look through all of that data and look at each um, piece in that and see what um, see what information we can find or or search through a list or an array of something and say oh, we're looking for a particular thing can we find that particular thing in the list so loops are very good for that um, and they link up really closely with the data structures that we use so the both the arrays and the linked lists we have methods for looping through both of those um, and they're very very strongly tied together it's like one of the main ways that we're going to be looping is is saying go through and check every value in something um, another meme <laughs> about looping well, it's not exactly about looping but this is the iterator that we would often use in our loops um, we've got some code here for looping through arrays so hopefully everyone is reasonably familiar with this um, the um, the the ability to loop through a single array like this is something that I would consider to be core and fundamental to your ability to code in C. Um, this kind of capability is, um, is something we've tested so many times now and we expect you to pretty much be able to write this loop here without having to think about it, you know? So um, this is something that uh, I think if you're gonna study something, it'd be like, yeah, get this one locked down and then go on to more complex things. Um, linked list as well is a similar thing, but instead of looping using a number with a linked list, we loop by moving our pointer. So we'd have a pointer aimed at starting at the first element of the list. This isn't the complete code, by the way, this is just snippets. And it moves on from one to the next, like that. Um, I guess the linked list is a little bit different from the arrays. Arrays are really formal data structure where we always know exactly how it works and we know in advance exactly how big the array is. This might be a hash to find in your code. Um, whereas here what we have is we're assuming that the linked list is a chain of nodes and the final one points at null. So that's why we have if the current is null then we're going to stop looping. And that works even if the list is empty or if it has elements in it already. Then we go on to arrays. <laughs> This was a kind of funny one, this this meme was like, if arrays started at 1, we would have been able to advance our technology to this amazing level. I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> I think that we might end up in the same situation that we're in now. But I thought it was a really funny meme nonetheless. So, as I said, looping and data structures and stuff. Obviously the next thing that we learned after looping was, how do we collect a bunch of information together? Um... Uh, Skiri Schrodinger is saying, did I pronounce it right this time? Hopefully. Why can't we put array i++? What exactly does i++ do if not just adding i to 1? Oh, there's actually a lot of subtle details about that. I'm not going to go into it though, because we're doing a speed run. That's a side quest. <laughs> we can talk about it later. <laughs> but there are actually weird things about i++ and plus plus i, if anyone's actually discovered there's another way of typing it. Anyway. So, arrays are collections of variables, and the way that we use arrays are, this is one chunk of memory. We'll treat it as memory that's like right next to each other, and um, each of the portions of the array, each of the pieces, the elements that we call in the array, is the same variable type. So, an array is always all the same variable type inside it, and each of these variables doesn't actually get a name. Only the, um, the total array gets a name, um, and every element inside only gets a number to be accessed instead of an array. Uh, we've got some code here for declaring an arrays. Um, one second, that doesn't actually need to be a zero. I'm gonna get back to that. Yeah, so we can declare an, an array that this just gets zeroed and then we can access individual elements. And if we wanna access via an index, we can use a variable to access as well. And so I think we've seen some of this stuff before, um, but hopefully people are like starting to get um, quite natural with these in a sense. It's like, yeah, I can access an individual element by using a variable. And if I want to, I can change that variable, which then gives me access to a different element. If I want to read an element, write an element, that kind of thing here, um, we can do that any way we want. So, so long as we've used the square brackets and an index, what we look at then becomes just one normal variable of the type of the array. So this is just the third element of the array, which is just an integer, and we can do stuff like that. Um, the only thing we need to be careful of is getting out of bounds of the array. So this array has 10 elements in it, 
The 10 elements will have the indexes 0 through to 9, which means if we try to do index 10 of that array, we'll be accessing an array outside of its bounds, so outside of its upper and lower limits, um, and that will usually cause an error when we run. Uh, if you're really unlucky, it won't cause an error. <laughs> and then you'll just access memory outside of the array and then start reading or writing numbers that you shouldn't be, or reading or writing over other parts of your program, which is really, really dangerous. But most, um, if not all modern compilers that you can find um, will will say, no, you can't do this. This is, this is bad. This is out of what memory this thing had claimed previously. Um, functions, this is actually an old meme. So this is something that was given to me in I want to say 2019, I think, because this was in person uh, when, when I was given these memes, because I don't think anyone had a functions meme from, from this term. So this is me doing the doing the Eddie Murphy thing. Is it like, that angle, that angle, yeah, there you go, yeah. Um, so, code that's written in a separate place, and what we do is we call it by name, and we get it to... Um, we get to run its code separately and then come back to us afterwards. So we say, you go off and run your code and then you return to me. That's why I use the return keyword. And the return might be returning with some information or the function might just end. And we have ways of setting that up. So we've got some code here for functions. So we will have a function declaration that just tells the rest of our code that the function exists and it has inputs and outputs. Um, and that is this declaration line, which is um, at the top of our um, file, somewhere at the top, um, but before our main, so that our main knows what it is. Or it could be in a header file. Now that we know that we have multiple file projects, we can put our function declarations in a header file and then have our main file include them. And so then the main file still knows what the um, uh, what the functions are going to be that it might use um, afterwards. So either in that same file, if this is all within one file, or if it's in a separate file, it would be in a separate C file, but just somewhere else um, that the program can find because it compiles it also, um, is the actual running code. So it says, all right, whenever I see that word add, it has to fit with the things that I already know about, integer out, two inches, integers in, which is what we're giving it here. And then somewhere else in my code, whenever I run, I'm going to look for this word add, and then I'm going to run the code that's there. So there's kind of like the difference between what we can do when we're compiling and what we can do when we're running. When we're running, all of this stuff is compiled already, so we know we can jump around and find stuff. When we're compiling, we need to know that whatever we're doing, we've been told about previously, and it's going to go top to bottom when it's compiling. All right, ooh, pointers. Okay, pointers was the bit there. We um, we we knew that we were going to um, uh, going to need to think about these a lot. So I've actually got a section in the uh, the, the next lecture about pointers. We're going to go into this in a little more detail. But pointers are variables, just like any other piece of information that I'm going to save on my computer in a sense while my program is running. Um, but the pointer, instead of um, being a value itself is a reference to another variable. So what it actually stores is the memory address of another variable. Um, well, sometimes it's another variable, sometimes it's empty, because we can actually store null in a pointer if we haven't yet found where we want to aim it. So, it can be another variable that's already in the program. It can also be memory that we've allocated. So I can actually talk about allocated memory now, as opposed to when I first talked about pointers. And it was like, why are we even doing this? And it's like, well, sometime later, we're actually going to learn that we have variables that don't have names. They've only been memory allocated, in which case we need pointers to be able to access them. So the thing that um, I think is one of the most difficult things about pointers is remembering these fiddly little... Um, uh, symbols that do things. So I actually would love to um, work with pointers and and have English word functions on them, like this star, instead of using the star, we could, we could have a function that said, this function goes to where the pointer is aimed at and reads the value of the variable that the pointer is aimed at. Um, instead of star, you'd be able to remember it more easily, I think, if it had some words in it, like a while loop or an if statement's easier to remember. Um, but anyway, the star will follow the pointer to whatever it's aimed at and say, okay, what's the value that I'm aimed at? And then the and says, 
if a variable already exists, we can put the AND on the variable to find its address. What this effectively is doing is giving us a pointer to that variable. It's not completely giving you the pointer because it hasn't set up the pointer in memory, it doesn't persist or anything, but you can at least get the address of a variable which you can then store in a pointer or pass to a function that's going to create a pointer from that variable address. When we have pointers to structs, we will use the um, what some people call the stab, um, the arrow which accesses a pointer but doesn't just access the variable at the end of the pointer, it goes into the variable at the end of the pointer and accesses a um, field inside the struct. <laughs> someone said, quick, someone take a picture of Mark doing the thinking pose. From the memes that have been submitted, I have noticed that people have been taking a lot of screenshots of me and putting them into memes. They, they're coming, they're coming in the lecture. All right, so we've got some simple pointers code here, which is like the creation of a pointer. So to initialize a pointer, we're going to need to give it a memory address, which means we need something that gives us a memory address. A simple thing that gives us a memory address is the address of a variable that already exists. Um, the star is our representation that we're creating a pointer. And later on, when we use the star, it's the use of the pointer. So we've got it here and here. So the star says we're not using the pointer i, I don't know if I should have used the letter i here, um, but where we're going to whatever value i points at because i is an integer pointer and so we're saying this is not editing the pointer, this is following the pointer to whatever variable it's aimed at and it's editing that variable. So that's what the star in front of the pointer is doing here. Alright, um, Things that we learnt, this was from the end of the last lecture, this is another meme that was... So I think I've reused this meme later, so let's just move on now. We're going to move on to today's lecture, so that was the first half of the course. Roughly up to week six, I think. Um, is, is Zach K... Zach, is that you, the tutor Zach, or is that a student called Zach K? I'm not sure if it is or it isn't. I mean, looking at what you're, um, what you're typing in there, it does sound like it is the tutor, Zach. <laughs> I'm adding you as a moderator, Zach. Okay, so now let's jump back into today's slides. So I only had to spend 17 minutes on those, so we were probably going to get through this speed run. Okay, so let's look at some of the topics that I talked about where programming wasn't just code, but it was, um, what is it? Oh, it's Rust. Okay, yeah, he's talking about Rust. Obviously, it's Zach the Tutor. <laughs> okay, so there were some other things we talked about. Like, one of the first things we talked about was, like, the history of computing, and I, I just gave you some tidbits, not a full-on history class or anything. We also looked at problem solving, code style code reviews, a lot of things that you know are becoming quite important to you because, um, if you've had a chance to do any code reviews, which is harder when we're largely online, you'll see how useful they can be um, to making your code work. And even just group coding is actually really good like that. Um, debugging, you will have done plenty of debugging by the time you finish this course. If you haven't done any debugging by the time you finish this course, you're either um, not doing any homework for starters or incredibly lucky. So um, basically, if we're programming at our capability, so at the level that we're, we're pushing ourselves, then we have no choice but to be doing debugging. Um, if you're not doing any debugging, it can mean that you maybe could, could be doing harder code. You could be doing more interesting things. So, so I feel like it's something that's always going to happen. When we talked about the theory of the computer, we looked at like, you know, what it means to have memory and processes and all this kind of stuff. And we started to get to the idea of like, what is hardware and how does it work? And it's, you know, it's, it's really full on because like, we've got these things in our houses, we've got these computers in our phones and all this kind of stuff. Um, but we don't have a full understanding of how they actually work. And so it's good to, um, it's good to play around with this and just sort of learn a little bit about like, you know, we're programming and programming is like this abstract concept, you know, but you step one level below programming, you're immediately talking to hardware on your computer. And that's an interesting and very strange thing to do.
Um, I gave a talk on professionalism as well. That was an optional talk in week six, so not everyone necessarily would have seen this yet. If you haven't, I suggest you go back and watch it. Um, it is a very interesting thing to think about. Um, because we here are in this intro to programming course at university. We're not even really thinking yet about getting jobs in the field or anything like that. But um, there are a lot of things that I think are, are quite fundamental to, you know, functioning at a professional level that are potentially more important than anything else I've taught you in the course. Like, when it comes down to it, they may end up being more important than what I've taught you in the course otherwise. Um, but they're outside of the curriculum because they're, they're very hard to teach, they're very hard to learn, they're not formal, um, but they're also very, very interesting and very useful and actually quite fulfilling to learn. So, go back and check that out if you want. I probably should have just gone into the slides rather than this. But anyway, problem solving. This is one of the funny ones. Um, and I'm pretty sure most everyone has um, been in this situation with their code. I certainly have been in this situation with my code. I am not going to not going to go into too much detail about how much code I have been, you know, paid a full-time salary to write. And it's looked like this, where it's like, it doesn't work. And we made some changes that started working, but we don't understand either situation. But yeah, that's, how, that's like how it is. <laughs> like, yeah, people are saying it's you today and literally assignment two and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it'll do that. Understanding will come with time. And once understanding comes with time, you will then move on to harder things that you still don't understand. That's, that's the nature of it. Um, but what I want everyone to do at least is to think about approaching problems with a plan. So we looked at this when we were doing problems. So we looked at the idea we could just panic and throw things away. Um, or we could say, okay, let's start breaking this down. Let's start learning how to separate a problem into parts um, and see if we can solve some of the smaller parts of the problem, which will reduce the size of the overall problem. And this is something you can take through into other parts of your life as well. It's not all parts of life, but a lot of things in life are going to be like apparently insurmountable issues where you can actually chip off a part of that issue and say, okay, I'm going to solve this little thing instead. And and even just solving that little thing will psychologically get you to a better position for solving bigger problems. So that's what I say, break things down into parts, complete the ones you can do easily, and then test each of the little parts to make sure they're working before piecing them back together. And then you have a better understanding of which, which parts of your program are suspect and which parts of your program are definitely going to work. Um, we looked at code style as well. <laughs> And I thought this one was quite funny. Uh, it's a like a Dungeons and Dragons style alignment chart for different levels of indentation. Uh, and I, th I thought they were quite funny. Like, it's always like the, the lawful good and stuff. It's like, yeah, okay, this is obviously what I'm going to teach. But then there's like these hilarious ones. Um, they're like, okay, chaotic evil is like inverting the indenting and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um... <laughs> indents eight spaces using the space bar. It's like that's like lawful evil is just just doing their own doing themselves like hilarious harm in just how long it's going to take you to code if you do that. Yeah, so this is quite funny. Um, there are there are lecturers in CSE who are chaotic good. <laughs> I think there are people who actually do the three indent space, but I think most of your lectures are going to be up here on good. Um, I'm lawful good, obviously, because you know I have to be have to be really above board when I'm doing things, but I think uh, in reality, I'm probably one of these somewhere. <laughs> okay, so anyway, too much time on the meme. So one thing to remember, and this is just like a, a catchphrase that we can remember for ourselves when we're coding. Half the code is for the machine, half the code is for humans. Because a lot of the time your code is like, you know, it's gonna get compiled and it's gonna get run, right? So that's that's important, it does need to do that. But it's gonna get modified, it's gonna get reused, it's gonna get explained to people so they can understand what's going on. All of that stuff is, is entirely human-based. It's got nothing to do with whether it compiles or not. Um, and so when we think about it, um, the readability of our code when we're really working with code. So more than just what we're doing in like labs and assignments and stuff like that. When you go on and you start really working with code um, at a professional level or at a research level, research is another profession, but you know, we often split the two. But you know, 
all working in a group to get a, a, a significant goal done with programming, you will find that more often than not, humans are reading each other's code than the machines are reading the code. Like, we're still going to need to test it and compile it and stuff and make it run, but the important times that we're working on our code is with humans. So, the more readable it is, the more efficient you are. Um, the quicker it will be to find errors, the quicker it will be to make the correct modifications and stuff like that. When it comes down to it in the end, um, spending more st more time on style than you spend on the um, the actual functioning substance of your code is probably going to be better for you in the end. Um, yeah, so I don't think I need to say too much more about this because I've been saying it a lot that um, if you can if you can get good access to your code. Um, it will make your debugging easier as well, and um, it will make it easier for other people to be able to help you. Anyone who's gone to help sessions uh, and brought in code that is hard to read, um, you will potentially, depending on who you're talking to, you'll potentially get this thing where a tutor will say to you, okay, you're going to need to fix up the style on this code. Um, otherwise, we're going to be here for the next two hours trying to find out what's going wrong with this code. I acknowledge that there is a problem with this code, but until you fix up the style in this code, we won't be able to help you. And then they'll put you back in the queue and go, come back when the style is finished. Um, and, and it'll be pretty good because like, actually that will take less time. Because you'll spend 15 minutes cleaning up the style and you'll come back and then it'll be like, the tutor will look at it and just go, oh, I can see your issue immediately. Whereas previously I couldn't see it at all because I couldn't read the code. So interesting and I think a good lesson okay code reviews um, this follows on very much from code style is that um, when we're trying to help each other we will be reviewing each other's code so we can learn a lot from reading other people's code um, we can learn a lot about um, other people's approach to the same problems as us um, we can also help people with the approaches to problems that they have um, one of the nice things you can get sometimes is even just like working real time with people um, you can get people who help you out with your code as you are writing it um, as we've seen here um, the, uh, the 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 trope of he's behind you <laughs> that i've put into the lectures um, and people have helped me out a lot with that when especially if it's like just a semicolon or something like that and people start yelling at me there are many memes on that but i use them in another section in the lecture they will happen um yeah uh, oh, I apologize, Skira, you're saying that um, the cues for help sessions... Yeah, we we tried to do as much as we can, but, like, we just had a lot of students this term. This is a, this is a record number of students this term. Um, 1511 has never had the, the risk of hitting a thousand students before, which we had this term. So, um, our, I think our setup is not, is not fully capable yet of dealing with it. We're going to have to do some work in the background and figure out how we can make sure that students can get as much help as they need. Um, at the moment, students are getting as much help as we can provide. Uh, the back-end forum, uh, the, the back-end Slack that we have running, has these desperate calls to see who's free when a help session is on to try to get help for students, but, like, it's not always, like, if we don't have tutors available, sometimes it's just, like, it just hits like that. I apologize. Yeah. Um, okay, so code reviews can be quite helpful. Uh, we learn and we teach in those code reviews. And also, we get this kind of greater than the sum of our parts thing where two people looking at a piece of code solves errors faster than two people working on code on their own separately. Uh, debugging. <laughs> so, this is... Whoever Malachi is, I'm not sure if you are on in the lecture at the moment. <laughs> they wrote a lot of memes. So they managed to make uh, make it in here with with quite a few. So he was like, um, one of the things we did with debugging was print statements. Now this is like a, a, a basic. Oh, hello, Tawaka. Thank you for all of your memes. <laughs> there were quite a few of them in there. Um. So yeah, one of the ways we looked at debugging was how do we get more information out of our program while it's running? And print statements in 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 select places in our code can do that. I'm going to say that with a bit of a caveat. Once you get better at programming, you won't use that technique anymore. You will move on to different techniques that have different capabilities. Um, but for the moment, you know, while we're keeping it simple and while you know how to use printf, it'll work. So what is debugging? 
Uh, the removal of, removal of bugs is debugging, and we think of bugs as errors in our program, and we um, we separated this into two types of errors, where syntax errors are code errors, so the code literally cannot run because we've typed in something that doesn't make sense, or logical errors, which are much more insidious, and I think in general going to become more common than syntax errors. Syntax errors are the things that uh, happen to you when you're early, uh, in your in your learning about a language, um, and when you jump to another language, you will create multiple syntax errors. Right? Uh, logical errors are things that uh, will stick with you through your entire programming career. In that, um, creating something like a logical error is like making something that we didn't intend to do. So we think that our code's going to do one thing, but it's actually doing a different thing. Um, so it's a misunderstanding or something like that. Or um, we read our specification incorrectly and we implemented perfect code, but it didn't match the specification, right? That kind of thing happens. Um, so the thing is, regardless of the language that you're in or the tools that you're using for debugging, the thing that we always want to do first is get more information, find out what's actually happening in our program. So one of the things we did for that was print statements. You get deeper into programming, you'll start using things called interactive debuggers that you can actually pull apart uh, what's happening in the code and step through it as it's running. So once we know more about what our program is doing, um, we know where the bug is happening more likely. So we can say, oh, the bug is happening between these lines because this is where I knew what was happening. And up until this point, we went into this function and then everything went weird after that. So it's like, okay, that's where you know where to look. So debugging is often I mean, like, this is really similar now that I'm talking about them within a few minutes of each other. It's really similar to the problem solving. We break things down into separate parts, and then we figure out what is and isn't working. So when we separate the parts of a, um, of a program when debugging, sometimes we can confirm that some parts are definitely working, and we can, cons we can confirm that we don't know something about the other parts of our program. So this can be quite good, and this is why we do a lot of testing. And sometimes we do a lot of really specific testing of only certain functions at a time. And you can think about this as um, when we do like a series of lab exercises, we test them completely separately. And then what we might do is to take a lot of these lab exercises and put them all together into a single program. Your assignments are a little bit like that, where we want you to get an entire stage working and for you to trust that it works before you use that as a component in another later stage. And that way you can say, I'm not really going to think that the new bug that's come up is necessarily in this old component. I will check this other things, other other parts of it first, right? So there's a lot of debugging is um, trying to take, you know, 10,000 lines of code and you know that one line of code is a problem. And if you were to look through all 10,000, that's, that's not efficient, right? But if we can say, 8,000 of these 10,000 lines of code have been tested thoroughly. We'll start looking at the other section and then we'll find out through running our program exactly where the issues are and try to fix them. So a lot of that is, um, is the theory of what debugging is. Uh, professionalism, I talked about this. Um, so the four pillars that I talked about, which I think are, are very useful. These are things that I, I put together based on things that I'd seen, but also a lot of talking to, to friends of mine who are um, at that level nowadays where they're the people who are going to be hiring you. So, I mean, there's an outside chance. <laughs> it's actually not that low percentage chance, but there's a chance that if you go for um, interviews at, um, at, at some of the major tech companies in Sydney and stuff like that, you're just going to run into my old friends. Um, it doesn't help you to mention me, by the way. That's, that would be weird. <laughs> Slightly nepotism as well, so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you may be interviewed by someone who, who I've actually asked about things um, in terms of professionalism. So we talk about being able to communicate, and this is human communication. This is the ability to talk to people, especially to be able to talk to people who don't also code or don't aren't also computer science professionals. So you need to be able to work with people and be able to say, look, this is what our, our computer program is going to do. And you need to be able to explain that in a way it's like, so what it's going to do, it's going to loop through the data and it's going to do this. It's like, no, 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 that's not the language that we need, right? It's like, this is the solution that we're going to provide to this problem. And it has these kinds of capabilities and limitations, right? When you can start to talk like that, you'll be able to actually um, really communicate about your code and show people how it can help them. 
Um, teamwork is another thing. So this is like, it's nearly the same thing. It's about communication. But this is like kind of more internally within your teams that you're working on. So teamwork is like, can we work together on things? Do you know when to push and do you know when to back off? Um, do you know when you should be in charge of something and when someone else should be in charge of something? And do you know how to organically flow between these things without offending each other and stuff like that? These are very important skills. I mean, like, we see this all the time. Anytime you put three or four people in a group together, um, you can just wait for a little while before the first argument comes up. And how people deal with um, disagreements and stuff like that is, is quite important. Um, uh, and so I think that like learning about that is pretty good and that's the kind of thing that you can do very easily outside of um, outside of the formal courses that you're going to get at university just volunteer for anything that has a bunch of people working towards a common goal you'll learn a lot about teamwork um, resilience is the other thing I'm not sure if the keyword resilience is the perfect word for it but it's a bit of it's not as dire as the idea of survival but it's the idea that um you want to enjoy what you're doing. I mean, like, I'm not saying it's always fun. They don't call it work because it's fun. They separate those two things, right? But if you're fulfilled by what you do and you're interested in what you what you do, then it's the kind of um, profession that you can continue happily. If you're exhausted by what you do, um, if it wears you down and you keep looking for an escape from what you're doing, then maybe you need to think about how you want to approach it or whether you want to actually look at other things or think in other ways and stuff like that so a lot of that stuff is um is is very good so you need to you need to be able to look after the people around you and you need to look after yourself because in general good teams are teams that do that for each other um and the fourth pillar of it is how good are your technical skills <laughs> So that's going back to your actual programming and stuff like that, which is all the rest of the course. I don't need to talk about that that much because we have very good systems in place already for teaching you those things and testing those things. All right. Break time. Wow, I didn't realize, oh, I have gone, I've gone really, f I've, maybe I'm speed running too fast. <laughs> okay, so I don't think that we're going to... Well, maybe we should because we're breaking between different topics. But then again, let me let me talk about what I want to talk about in the break time slide. Because I think that this is something that's super, super interesting and super important for everyone. So this is a thought exercise for you to think about the future. You know when, like, I don't know if anyone's been in a job interview. One of the questions which I now consider to be one of the dumbest questions that we could um, we could ask in a job interview is like, where do you see yourself in five years? People love it um, because it's a question that makes people think about the future. Um, and I, I think it's like, yeah, I think the original intention for the question was really good. Um, but now, because it's in every single job interview that ever exists, um, it's no longer a good question because everyone has like a, a sort of dumb prepared response for it. But what I would like you to all think about is this question. Why are you doing computer science? Um, not everyone here is doing computer science, but I know that this term, at least, everyone is restricted to um, to this course. Everyone's been restricted to, um, to being someone who is in a computing major. Unless there was like little exemptions here and there. Sometimes there are. But most everyone here is is looking at this field as their primary field. So I want you to be able to ask this question of yourself. And I don't even need you to have an answer to it yet. But ask this question of yourself. Why are you doing this? What do you want to get out of this? Do you want to be somewhere from this? Like, do you want to get a job out of this? Do you want to go into research? Do you want to like, you know, discover new things about computing that have never been seen before? Do you want to change the world? You know, do you, do you want to create um, a, an app that changes the way that people communicate with each other? I mean, it's been done, <laughs> but, there's, but there's, you know, there's plenty of opportunities still out there. Is there something that you want from this? Um, and then you can say to yourself, all right, if there is something that I do want from this, if there's something that I, I want this to affect my life in some way, then you can say to yourself, all right, so I've got, say, three years at UNSW. Um, if you chill, four years, five years, you know, nine years <laughs> for a three-year degree, that happens. Um, 
how are you going to push yourself towards these goals that you want to achieve in your time here? And it's an interesting thing, right? Because one thing that I found more than anything else is that um, if people know why they're doing something, it makes a big difference to them. You know, like, this is a classic kind of thing in high school where, like, people are doing maths and, like, <laughs> the teacher's like, you've got to learn this. And students are like, why? Like, I, I, have, I see no use for this. Like, I have no reason to understand this. Like, there's no context, context in my life. I don't think I'm ever going to use it again. And the teachers often don't have a good answer to that because there might not be a good answer to that because we don't know where people are going to go. Um, we're luckier here because we're actually at a point where we're teaching your adults. You can actually decide where you think you want to go in the future. And so you can say, oh, this is my goal. I want to do this. And it's like, yeah, well, okay, in that case, look at these particular subjects because they're going to take you closer to that goal than other things. Or your goal is like, I don't know what I'm doing yet. And in that case, it's like, all right, in that case, take a breadth of subjects and see which one inspires you. Start taking subjects that aren't in computing, because maybe if nothing's inspiring you about computing, there are other things that you can do, right? So, but I think the thing is, and I do this every year, every year at some point, I will sit down with myself and I say, what do you want to do with your life? It's, it, it's insanely depressing. <laughs> it's not always, but sometimes it's like super depressing. So sometimes when it, and when it is depressing, then it was a good question to ask. Because it's like, if you think that what you're doing now is not fulfilling the goals that you have for your life, then you need to think about, well, if that's the case, then just blindly continuing along with it may not be the, the best idea. You need to think about it. And so what this will often do, this exercise will either put you on a path where you are doing something that um, you want to do, or if you're if you're not going to change what you're doing, it'll confirm things for you, and you'll be more motivated to actually continue what you're doing because you know it's taking you where you want to be. Um, but when you find yourself in a situation where things aren't taking you where you want to be, it's also very useful then because it, it gives you an idea of like, okay, where do I go then? What do I? What changes do I make? Um, and this is all about sort of taking control of your own life. And this is like the third pillar when I was talking about professionalism, that resilience thing, right? Um, and it's good to, to ask these questions of yourself because someone said midlife crisis. It's not always a midlife crisis, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's important because if you don't put yourselves in these sort of mini crisis situations, then you're just going to end up down what we consider to be like kind of fulfillment dead ends where you're not, you're not happy with what your life did. And like, sometimes it's years of doing that before you realize that you're not happy with what your life did. Okay. So on that note, this is actually usually more positive than this because it actually is a positive thing because what it does most of the time is it gives people direction in their life and they go, Oh, this is what I want, you know? And I, I can put myself where I want and I can put myself working towards the goals where I want to be. And, and, and you find yourself just effortlessly working hard at things because you're actually doing what you want. Anyway, let's take a break now. It is 4.42. We'll take a five minute break. We'll come back at 4.47 and we'll continue on uh, looking at um, uh, going back to like the specific topic, topic material, I think, for the rest of the course.
All right, we're back. I had I had just enough time in the break. I didn't even stand up. <laughs> Usually, I will go, I'll walk away for a second, but like I um I had enough time in the break to to put up a bunch of links that people were looking for. There's a there's a podcast that was when was that? That was last year. It would have been mid last year, I think, because I think we were under COVID restrictions still we were sitting like three meters away from each other and, and microphones on either either end of like a long table um so i think it must have been during 2020 sometime and um csc sock interviewed me about you know um kind of everything <laughs> yeah talking about teaching computing how i got into teaching and how i got into programming and stuff like that so it's kind of interesting oh and i forgot the link to my experience uh that's that's been in lots of emails and stuff like that so so I'll, maybe I'll link that later. <laughs> it's all right. Let's go back into the lecture. Okay. So, oh, <laughs> is there, is there, are we missing a link to my experience? I will copy this link, paste it in there. <laughs> I love it when the slides answer the questions for me. Okay. So, the Course My Experience survey is something that we give to UNSW to administer for us, which basically collects all the information from the students, makes it anonymous, and then passes it to me. Um, you can also uh, fill these out for the, for the course and for the individuals who taught you. So you can actually fill them out for your tutors as well. And it makes a big difference to the tutors because um, for them, they um this might be their first time doing it um they may not have that much experience with it um the feedback for them is very very useful um for me the feedback is very very useful for the course itself um i think it's very important because um what i do with the course is based on what people think of it so if a lot of people say that um um, so, for example, something that I've gotten in the past is people are saying, we did so much effort on those assignments. Why are they worth so little marks? And they used to be worth less marks than they were now. So your assignments are now worth, I think, what is it, together? The assignments are worth the same as the exam or even more? I don't know. I, I know that the coursework is now worth more than the exam, whereas it used to be that the exam was um, the... Um, the major part of the course and then everything else you did in the course was smaller but we kind of shifted the marks around a bit so that um, people were getting a more kind of perceived marks for effort value because you think about the second assignment and how much that's worth that's now worth a quarter of the course which is I think good because like the it, it only lasts for the three weeks of the course and you're spending a lot of that time so it's like it's literally a quarter of the course. It can be a quarter of the marks for the course. Um, it used to only be like 10 or 15% or something. And people, people were like, my God, why are you doing so much work for so little marks? So yeah, little things like that change. Um, and, and really, we wouldn't necessarily be making those changes unless we we're getting good feedback from people. Um, yeah, auditions give, give me the exact numbers there. Yeah, so it's 40% at the moment. 15 for the first, 25 for the second. I think it used to be like 30% total, and it was like 15 for each. I'd have to go back through the old course outlines. I know that I've been slowly shifting things around. It's always hard to remember exactly what things used to be. Okay, so let's continue back into the... Um, into the content, the, the sort of the um, the technical content of the course. So we got up to pointers, um, and then we were looking at characters and strings. So these are new new memes from people about um, what uh, strings are in C. So I meant, must have said something about the fact that like strings as an object don't actually exist in C. Only the only thing we have is an array of characters, and we're going to call them strings. We're going to use them. We're going to use the double quotes and stuff. But but as a as a as a variable of its own type, the idea of a string doesn't exist. Uh, so I see that the two people who wrote these two memes are in chat at the moment, and both very happy that they got their mention here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so 
we use strings to represent characters and wo- uh, letters and words. Um, even numbers can be represented as strings. It's just a bit harder to do calculation with them when we're representing them as numbers. So the character is an eight-bit integer, and it's interesting that when I always say this, that like it is used to encode a character, but it's actually just run the same way as an integer. So the only thing that makes it a letter is us choosing to use a representation of it that is a letter, and that representation is using the ASCII encoding, which is where the numbers between 0 and, I think it's just 0 and 125, the original ASCII. So the other rest of the 8 bits, you could nearly do use only 4 bits and get away with it. But the rest of the 8 bits is used for other things, potentially. But most of ASCII encoding is just 0 to 127, I think. Did I say 128? Yeah, well, 128 different numbers, 0 to 127. Um, you don't need to know the ASCII table, you can look it up if you need it. Um, sometimes we accidentally end up memorizing some of it, but not important. Always the kind of thing you'd look up again. Um, when we use strings, they are just arrays of characters. Um, other programming languages, which you will meet eventually, will have their own specific string objects. C is less... Um, C doesn't like building up lots and lots of complicated structures. C lets you build up your own complicated structures. And so when we do strings, we kind of do them ourselves. So we use the simple structures that we have, which are arrays. And then what we will often do, because strings can change in length quite happily, like a lot of the words we use are all different lengths. Look at all the words on this slide, you know, they range between two letter words up to like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, eight letter words. I don't know if there's any longer ones. Characters is probably longer, yeah, right? So, like, just different length words. So, the array that we're going to use to store, like, a single word, there's no way for us to pick a length that is definitely going to work and be in exactly the right length. So, what we'll usually do is pick something longer than we need and then use a specific character in it to say, this is the point where we stop. And that's the thing we call the null terminator. And what we do is anytime we're looping through a string to find the letters or to look through to read the letters or anything, if we hit the null terminator, we'll stop looping. And that's how all of the functions in the C uh, string library are going to be working, is they're going to be looking for that null terminator and stopping when they hit the null terminator. So that kind of thing is going to happen. Um, and that is a convention that we use with the strings, and we really don't consider something to be a valid string in C unless it is finished by a null terminator. All your C library functions that are going to work with this are going to expect it, and if they don't get it, stuff's going to break in interesting ways. So, basics. I think this is copied from one of my examples. Um, if we want to, we can read user input. So what we do is we get someone to type something in, in the terminal. This might even be a lab solution. I can't remember if we ever did this where it was like read a string and then type it out vertically. Um, but this is the kind of code we'd use to do that. So we'd set up an input string and this is a hash defined I've got somewhere else in my code for maximum length. We read the input um, up to the maximum length from the standard in as in standard input is like what the user has typed in the terminal and we put that into this input thing and then um, after our f gets, we're going to print out that string. So I use the printf uh, string there. I could have used f puts as well. That would have also worked. And if I wanted to print out this string vertically, I can loop through the string one element at a time, printing it out as a character, and then put a new line afterwards. And so that'll do that. So just an example of stuff we can do with strings. Now we also looked at structures. Someone's saying seven bits. Did I say four bits? Ah, oh, that's hilarious. I just halved the number of bits. Isn't that isn't that a hilarious mistake to 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 make as someone who is the lecturer and supposed to be in charge of these things? Um, one less bit halves the total number of values, not four less bits. <laughs> anyway, that's funny. Look, it's the end of term for me as well. <laughs> Like, if anyone's not exhausted by this point, um, then either you've had a really, really good term where you're going to fail all your subjects, but you're really happy with yourself, or, <laughs> or you're exhausted because you've been putting a whole lot of work in the last 10 weeks, and, and so I'm going to allow myself to make a few mistakes, as I'm going to allow you to make a few mistakes as well by this end of the term. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's go into structs. Um, structs are custom-built variables, in a sense, where um, 
what we're going to do is we're going to declare a collection of variables, which is actually quite different from the collections of variables we have like arrays, where we can actually have lots of different types and we can define all these different things all within this struct. And um, the, um, the way that we do this is that we name each of these things inside the struct and we can access them um, underneath an umbrella variable name in a sense. So the struct is a variable and it contains other variables and they all have names as opposed to arrays which only have numbers. So we'd use the dot operator to access the fields inside the struct, but what we're going to do most of the time when we're using structs is we're going to memory allocate them. And so this is the nice thing about this is I can just talk about memory allocation now even though it's in the future in this lecture. So if we have a pointer to a struct, we would use the stab the arrow here to access the fields inside the struct as opposed to the dot if we're holding the structure itself so if we have the variable itself then we'd use the dot to access the things but if we don't have the variable and we only have a pointer to the variable um, then we use this arrow to access the um, the fields within the struct okay so here I have a new example so I went on a spaceship thing for this lecture so I have a structure of the spaceship um, it has a name, and I've set some kind of maximum name there. Um, it has a certain number of engines and a certain number of wings. Because what we like uh, more than anything if we're, if we're making spaceships is to put things on them that are completely irrelevant, like wings, because you only need wings if you're flying in atmosphere. <laughs> so the important things about a sci-fi spaceship is adding extra wings. So here I've got my spaceship, uh, and the variable is X-wing. So this is a Star Wars reference, obviously. Um, I'm not actually wearing a Star Wars t-shirt. I wore this t-shirt for fun today. It's a Sonic the Hedgehog t-shirt, but it says game over because it's the last lecture. Um, <laughs> Otawaka was asking, why is it called Stab? I don't know. Other people call it Stab, and so I allowed them to call it Stab, and I started occasionally calling it Stab myself. I think it's just because it's sharp. <laughs> like, there's really no other reason. Okay, so my spaceship structure contains a string and two integers. Each one of these things has its own name, and then what we can do is we can create one here by saying, okay, this is my X-Wing, and I'm copying a name into the X-Wing using a string standard library function, and then I'm assigning values to the number of engines and the number of wings on this particular spaceship. Um, and then what I can do is I can make a pointer to my spaceship, and if I have a pointer to this spaceship called my ship, then if I'm going to access the parts inside, then I'll use the, the arrow or the stab here instead of the dot. The dot is if I have the actual variable, but if I only have a pointer to the variable here, this is a struct spaceship pointer, my ship, then accessing through the pointer, I'd use the arrow. So my ship takes a hit and it loses an engine and a wing like that. So I just did a minus minus on each of those variables. Um, what are people saying? Shay thinks Andrew Bennett was the first person to say stab. He may have been the first person who I heard say stab and I picked it up. Okay. So we have memory as well. And we thought uh, we, we, we learned a bit about the different types of memory that we might have in our computers. So I consider like everything in the computer to be some form of memory in terms of places we can store our information. Um, when we run our programs, our code is in memory and all our variables in memory. And um, the other thing is like this, the idea of scope of our things is our memory is compartmentalized into different things. So every curly set of curly brackets is its own little section. Um, and you can't really see variables that are um, in other sets of curly brackets. If they're in a curly brackets that surrounds yours, then yeah, you're all in the same space. But um, when you have separate sets of curly brackets, for example, if we have my main and my functions, um, when my main is running, it sees what it sees, and when my function's running, it only sees what's within its own curly brackets. So the only information that my function can see from my main is anything that has explicitly been passed into the function um, that we can see. But sometimes we want things to, um, to not necessarily be just within the function. Um, and this is where we use 
actual memory allocation and this this allows us to put things in memory that is not inside the curly brackets so this is just floating somewhere basically in our program and we have the capability to to access it via pointers and the interesting thing about anything we do like this with memory allocation is it's not within the rules of the curly brackets because it did never existed inside any of the curly brackets so it never gets cleaned up automatically by curly brackets so what we do is we allocate it we can use it and it lasts longer than the functions that it's in but the downside is that it potentially lasts longer than the main function that it's in or it lasts longer than any of the things that are ever going to use it again so we need to explicitly say that we're going to let that memory go when we're done with it um, best example i can think of for this is when you remove an element from a linked list you know that you're never going to use it again um, but if you don't free that from memory um, your program is still going to have memory assigned to that piece of the linked list and the more you just add and remove to a linked list over let's say hours of running a program the more of these tiny floating um, no longer used pieces of linked lists are in your memory and they're known as memory leaks because it's like our memory is disappearing from our computer system and then we won't be able to use it anymore we won't be able to assign it to anything else so that's why we free memory when we're using memory allocation size of is really handy for this so when we have the um the line that we have every time we allocate memory pretty much we've used exactly this line here where we have had a pointer to something it's a struct or it's a variable type or something like that and then that same type that we're making a pointer to will be the size of memory that we're allocating. So we're going to allocate some memory um, and we're going to allocate that much memory and then malloc is going to give me a pointer to that much memory which then I'm going to name something and keep track of so that I can keep getting access to that memory. So this is my same struct spaceship in here. I have declared a spaceship and this time I've called it the Millennium Falcon and it has one engine and zero wings. I don't know if you count it as having one wing or zero, but I'm going to go for zero. And let's say, for example, I lost my ship in a game of Sabak. That's a card game in Star Wars, by the way. <laughs> then I will free its memory because it's no longer my ship to access. So I can free the memory and my ship is gone like that. So when we hit this point, we jumped into uh, an interesting idea. What did we have at this point? I don't know if you can hear that. Come on. No, she meowed at me, but she just stayed in the corridor. She's not coming. Anyway, she'll come in a moment and <laughs> we'll say hi. So, what did we build up? We had pointers. We had structs. We had memory allocation. We now have linked lists, right? So we now have the <laughs> people are like people heard chicken. All right, give me a sec. I know that we're a little ahead of time, so I can have a moment here. I'm gonna go get chicken. Hello. Come on. There we go. Everyone wanted to see you because this is the last lecture. <laughs> you heard her talking to me as she was walking up there as well. All right, I'm going to put her on my lap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's, oh, no. She doesn't want to be on my lap. I think she's like too much of uh, running around this afternoon. But anyway, she got to say goodbye in the end. All right. So let's let's talk about linked lists. So given all of those capabilities that we have, we had the ability to create structs. We had the ability to memory allocate those structs. And then we had the ability to link those structs together. And then um, we will have a linked list. Well, Ollie was saying, how come I never post chicken in, in the OR channel? Which one is that? Is that the CSC SOC Discord or something? Okay, I'll post something later on. Okay, anyway. We can now build this structure, and this is a really, really interesting data structure, right? So we had arrays before, and arrays were kind of limited. We had structs. Structs are also, like, you know, they're very variable in what they can store, but they're still limited in what they're... They, they can't grow and shrink their capacity, 
or anything like that. But here in linked lists, we, we totally can. And so it's a really, really interesting data structure because we can insert or remove elements from anywhere in this just by moving pointers around. Um, we can have a, a data structure that uses only exactly as much memory as it needs. You know, as you add things, it gets bigger, it takes up more memory. As you remove things, it gets smaller, it takes up less memory. There are still reasons to use arrays though, because arrays are like in blocks of memory right next to each other, so they're a little easier to move through than a linked list. Um, but the linked list is something that is like, it, it's very, very versatile for what it can do. Um, so there's more kind of easy capabilities that it has than arrays, but then it's also harder to set up and harder to understand, as you know, because the second assignment is harder than the first assignment. There's a reason why they go in that order. <laughs> you know, we teach you the easy things, get you a lot of familiarity, and then we teach you harder things, and we ask you to show that, right? It's a basic progression of learning stuff. So, this is another meme from the course. Uh, I know a guy who knows a guy. Let's look at a little bit of... Um, uh, linkless code again just a, a theoretical example here um, I have um, locations so these are these are these are planets um, and this is like um, the name of the planet and then the next planet in the list and so I can create a um, a, a linked list of these by just adding these nodes to a linked list that already exists so my first linked list is empty it has a null, and then I add a node into it, and that is Tatooine. And then after that, I add a node into it, which is Yavin 4. Um, by the way, if anyone wants to know, these are all Star Wars references. So a lot of, a lot of the, the references today are um, spaceships and stuff like that. So I have a function here to add a node, and what it's going to do is it's going to do the magic thing. The magic malloc line that is always the same. A pointer to a certain type, and we give it a name the um the size of is the same type that we had the pointer to and then we do the malloc um, then what we're doing is we're putting the information in there and we're saying that um this node gets the name that it's given um this node um has its next aim at whatever the list is so this is obviously adding to the start of the list yeah and returning the new head and then it returns the node it just created so basically we've got a list and we add a node to the beginning. So this is the, the list is empty. We add a node, it becomes the beginning of the list. And then we add another node and it becomes the beginning of the list. And this one gets pushed further along and so on and so forth. So I think we did this when we were first putting a list together for that battle royale game that we did. Um, and so this is the kind of code that we use for creating a simple creation of a linked list. And I wanted to, there is no space for my face here. I'm just going to go here first and then I'll move myself wait there you go I will just change where I'm sitting <laughs> so I wanted to go a little bit deeper into these things to so talk about pointers and structs and memory because um, I think these are the bits that are most likely to to catch people out and slip up so I'm gonna go over a bit of um, uh, a bit of these in detail so thinking about what a pointer is a pointer is a variable that stores a memory address, right? So that's a specific kind of thing. We think of a pointer as a way of accessing another variable, but the way it's accessing another variable is it's storing the address, so it's storing the location of something else. Uh, the examples that I used in lectures when I was talking about this is that if I give you a street address, um, then you'll be able to find a location. So if I give you a street address in Sydney, those of you who are in Sydney at the moment, you would be able to navigate there and find there. Even if you weren't in Sydney, you could still Google map something and then find it, right? Um, I can give multiple people that same address. They will all still be able to find the same place, right? So you can have multiple pointers aimed at the same thing. It doesn't really change what the thing is. It just changes how many things can access it. So if you change a pointer itself, so if you don't use the star on the pointer, which follows it to its destination, if you change it, it's like taking that piece of paper with the address written on it and then starting to write something else on it, right? That just changes where that address is going to send you to. So changing a pointer doesn't change anything at the destination. It just changes the, um, the location it's aimed at. Then if we have the star, I'm just going to go up here, right? When we have the star, what that does is it says, we are no longer looking at the pointer. 
itself. We are following the pointer through to what it was aimed at. So we're following it to its destination. And then once we've put a star on a pointer, then we're going to say we're going to change something at the destination. So this process is called dereferencing. And I've said this a few times before, but I just wanted to go back over this in this kind of um, overview at the end of term to help people kind of get the idea of how this works. So the pointer is a reference to something. Dereferencing means we're going, we're following the reference to its thing. Um, what's oh? People are talking about a meme review and a chill session. So we will, I will do something after the exam. We'll hang out. I actually have plans. I have, I have plans for like a whole of next term to do some streaming and stuff like that because I'm not lecturing next term. So I've I've done comp one five one one seven times in a row straight. And um, the university has has decided that that is enough. Mark could do with a bit of a break, and I understand that 100%. Um, and um, and so I won't be lecturing. So I will probably be doing some streaming and some other stuff, and just maybe maybe some things that might be interesting for people. Some collaborations with CSE Slack and stuff like that. But we'll see. Um, someone asked who is lecturing next term. I'm pretty sure Andrew Taylor is scheduled to lecture next term. Andrew Taylor actually wrote this course before I started editing it um, about two years ago when I started editing the course so a lot of the um, the basic foundations of why this course works so well is his work so perfect person to take it yeah okay so when we're talking about I don't need to move my face out of the way of that one um, now oh, someone also asked, do I ever do any courses other than Comp 1511? Well, <laughs> that's interesting because what I'm doing in second term is preparing a course for third term this year, which is Comp 3421. So that's a third year course in computer graphics. So I'm going to be teaching people about 3D graphics and how to make it and stuff like that. Um, a, a lot of what I'm going to do during next term I think is going to be showing people that process of how I build a course up because I think a lot of students are interested in that kind of idea all right <laughs> anyway um oh well, Eleanor is that a paid paid it's not it's not leave no I'm still working the whole time I'm also supervising a, a, a research student and, and some other bits and pieces so there's, there's still actually a lot of work that I'm going to be doing um Yeah, as we'll lead saying, it's not really leave if I'm rebuilding a course. It's, yeah, it's a lot of work. Okay, okay. Back to what we're talking about, right. So, what's the difference between a, a, a pointer and, like, what is the stab? What is the arrow? Um, we need to remember that this is accessing a struct at the end of a pointer, and the arrow points at one of the fields inside the struct. So one of the variables inside the struct variable is accessed via the stab. So what we do is we say, here's a thing, and we follow the pointer to the end and we know that because it's an arrow it's looking at one of the fields inside the variable at the end and then we look at it um so the this arrow is doing two things dereferencing the pointer to get to a struct and it only works if it gets to a struct and it's access accessing the field inside the struct so we do get the situation where a pointer to a struct that contains another pointer can access other structs and we can do more arrows. So we can do chains of pointers like a track. This is not exactly the same code as in your assignment, but it's the idea of what's in your assignment. So I can go from the track to the beat to a note inside end. So we can chain these together like this. Things do get complicated, so we do need to think about how careful we're being with these. Um, people are saying... Oh, someone was asking about Unity. We're not, uh, we're not necessarily teaching Unity uh, at CSE. Although, um, actually, you can teach that to yourself. It's actually pretty easy, especially once you know a bit of code. Anyway, let's go on to the actual lecture itself. So, here I have a, um, uh, a, a demonstration here, which is like what we're going to do is um, use the previous stuff to put together some, um, some planets. So I've got Dantooine. And Alderaan, and then um, I will say I'm going to create a new um, location pointer called Alderaan and copy that from the head because I'm pretty sure at this point the head of the list that I have is Alderaan. Um, and then I'm going to do this weird thing with this. I'm going to I'm going to say 
uh, actually don't need this older on anymore and so what I'm gonna do is just malloc new memory over this in a sense so um, it's kind of like yeah I'm gonna use Alderaan, Alderaan versus Dantooin because Dantooine's too remote to make an effective demonstration if you get that reference please please let me know that's very important to me okay so <laughs> what we have here is what has happened here when I did this so when I said the head, which I said the head is the head of this list, the head is now going to be a memory allocation of a new, of, of a new struct. Does that mean what I'm doing is I'm reallocating that memory? So what I'm doing is I'm wiping out Alderaan, for example, and replacing it with new memory that's like uh, whatever, like empty space or something like that, or, or is something else happening? And so this is like something where I just want to talk about how pointers work and stuff like that. And so let's look at what actually happens in this situation. So I had this, I created the linked list, first two lines here. So I added Dantooine to an empty list and then I added Alderaan as the head of a new list. So Alderaan becomes the head of the new list pointed at Dantooine, which is then pointed at null. And so this is like just a standard linked list. And then what I did was I had this line here a location pointer called Alderaan is equal to the head, which means it's a copy of whatever information was stored in the head. The information stored in the head was the location of this linked list node. And then Alderaan now is a copy of the location of that linked list node. So I have two pointers now pointing at the same node, which is fine. You can have multiple pointers pointing at the same thing, no worries. Um, and then this one points at next and it goes at null. So right, that's the same thing that's happened. So that line of code has happened, that's okay. And then this is the confusing line of code. What happens if I malloc over the top of one of these pointers, right? Is that going to change the pointer? Um, is it going to change the, um, uh, the node that the pointer is aimed at? And we need to think about the order of these things are gonna run. So the first thing that's gonna run is the malloc. And the second thing that's gonna run is the assignment of the result of malloc to this variable which is a struct location pointer variable. So this is actually what happens. So the first thing allocates new memory and then assigns the address of that memory to the head pointer. So this new memory gets allocated somewhere else. It's not actually gonna overwrite this variable here because we did not put a star on the head. We didn't say we're following this to its location. What we did is we said head is now going to point at something different malloc gives us the memory address of the thing that we've just created memory allocation will create something a struct location sized amount of memory and it will say here is the address of that memory if we store that address in head what that does is it changes where head points and head is now aimed at this new node that didn't exist before so we have this linked list here and we have this new node that we've just created with memory allocation and we've changed where head aims so what we didn't do that we thought may have happened is this line did not change the thing that head was aimed at was here. It didn't assign a new thing to this variable. What it did was it creates a new variable and it changed the pointer head. So this is the difference of changing a pointer rather than changing the thing at the end of the pointer. So just changing the pointer changes where it aims. So this is the kind of stuff which I think people have been um, been learning a lot about in terms of um, working with these things in assignment two, I hope, and working on this understanding of like, what's the difference between editing a pointer and editing, well, assigning a value, I guess, to a pointer or assigning a value to the star of a pointer. When you assign a value to the star of a pointer, then you're following the pointer to its location and then editing whatever's in memory there. But if you're changing the pointer itself, all you're doing is changing where it aims. So it's a slightly different kind of way of thinking about things. So you can do a lot of weirdness with pointers. We can hit a point where it's very, very hard to keep track of where we're going. I'm not even sure if this actually makes sense entirely in your, um, in your assignments, but I think you have a track and you go into the 
the the list of beats in the track and then you can go to the next one so this one would have been the head of the list of beats this is the second beat and then you go into the notes that are in that beat and you can go into the second note in that beat and so technically there are plenty of ways to set up stuff in your second assignment where where this finds something and this this genuinely finds some information right because what i've done is i've gone into this struct and I've taken one field of this struct which is the list of beats and then I've gone to the second one in that and then in that one I went into it in the, its notes and then I went into the second note of that one you can actually think of a structure where that totally works um, the thing that you do need to think about more than whether this works or not is is whether this is going to turn a human brain inside out or not is someone going to be able to read this and go, oh, I know exactly where you are <laughs> in your in your data structure because like that's pretty confusing. If I ever see a line of code that has this many arrows and I'm just like, oh, are you sure about this? Are you sure we shouldn't have some functions that are like doing this kind of thing or not? Like it's got to be really careful with that. So um, that's why I say this is an idea that might work. In, in CSB it's implementation. So it really depends on how it's running. But the things to remember, when you change a pointer, it changes its value, which is its memory address, which changes where it's aiming. It does not change any of the data in a sense, unless you consider the pointer itself to be some data, which it kind of is, yeah. Um, but if you take that pointer and you use the arrow on it, then what you're doing is you're looking at a field inside the structure. then you're looking at the actual data that's happening. So for example, oh, this is a bad example, it's gone too deep, but here notes next, I'll be looking at an actual note, the note that came after this particular note, right? Um, so once we use the arrow, we have, we're not in pointer world anymore, where we're thinking about things, aiming at things, we've gone right into memory and we said this pointer was aimed at this object, now we're reading stuff out of that object. Um, yeah. So once we use the arrow, and this is the same as the star, the arrow and the star both are things that dereference a pointer. And so they will take us from pointer space into actual memory where we will be looking at things. So I just wanted to go over that again. And this is something that sort of came up for me, I guess, in the recap, where it's like, I'm going to recap all these things. And I'm going to speed run through this other stuff. But, but when we get to this stuff, I do want to look at it in detail. Um, yeah, and someone's saying, can we actually have that many arrows? And we can, so long as there are still pointers aimed at other things. Um, the the limit is whether these things actually exist or not. And also, um, as Tawako is saying there, this is a really kind of dangerous because, like, what if this one's null? And if that's not null, what if this one's null? And if that's not null, what if this one's null? And this, yeah. And so you have to do all these checks. That's why doing this long chain like this is, is pretty dangerous code. Okay, other things that we looked at. So we've, we've gone through the, the linked list thing and, um, and a little sort of recap on pointers and stuff. Someone said, Joseph said, they did that in the assignment, like multiple pointers. Um, okay, so abstract data types. And, and I find this really interesting because the idea of abstraction is something that like will, will follow you through a lot of programming uh, and will be used in lots of different ways. Um, if anyone's heard of like the term object oriented programming, it's something that is not as prevalent as it used to be. But in the, I would say in the nineties, in the early two thousands as well, object oriented programming was seen as like this, the holy grail of how everything should be programmed. Um, we're sort of moving on from that because as we should, we progress through and what used to be the best, we feel like we could have improved on that. So we improve on it, we change other things as well. But abstraction is one of the parts of object-oriented programming that is still in use a lot. It's the idea that what we can do is we can separate the use of something from the complete knowledge of how it works. So I can use something without knowing what's happening underneath. Um, the example I like to use of this a lot is a car. Like I do not know the exact workings of the internal combustion engine which is inside most cars i don't know in that much about electric motors either which is in other cars um but i know that when i sit in a car and i turn the wheel one way or the other it makes the steering turn one way or the other i don't know the details of how that works when i press the accelerator the car goes forward you know i press the brakes it stops moving um and just simple ideas like that is the same kind of thing we do with abstraction. 
here's a function and we tell you that this function is going to do a certain thing. Somewhere behind the scenes there's a whole lot of code making that work but you don't need to know. And the more you know about it, the more it might confuse you. So it's easier to just use things without necessarily knowing how they work. For example, um, a lot of abstraction is in our C standard libraries, in a sense. So when we when we call a function like printf or scanf, someone else has done the work for us and we just use the function, right? And in our assignments, we're working on that kind of thing as well, assignment two, which is we're actually providing the um, the workings behind the abstraction. So this idea is really nice because it allows us to use things that we don't fully understand. Now, I know that sounds super dangerous, but using things we don't fully understand gives us more capability to work on the things that we do understand, trusting that someone else has sorted that out in the background, right? Um, so not only does it give us this capability to use things where we don't have to get you know really caught up in the nitty gritty of rebuilding other things that people have done, um, it also stops us from doing things weird with other things. So we looked at a stack when we were working on this. And the idea that's interesting about a stack is like it has rules about which elements you can add or where the elements go when you add something to the stack. And when you remove something from the stack, there's only one element you're allowed to remove from the stack. If I was to implement a stack as an array, for example, and I just left that array in my code, it would mean that someone would be able to read elements from anywhere in the stack, which would break the rules of the stack. Um, so if I want to keep that safe, I can keep the implementation of the stack hidden from the person using it, and the only thing they will get access to is a set of functions. So when they say I want to take something from the stack, I, you, I can say to them, yes, you can have the top element of the stack only, you know? and so. Uh, you can do things like that to make sure that these, these in a sense, uh, rules for how you're working with things are followed. Uh, and then it's easier for you to kind of work with data without making mistakes. Um, also means that you only have to think about some of it at a time. And I think like the way that, you know, human brains work is we're limited into in the number of things that we can think about at any one point in time. And if you're thinking about all of the deep implementation of something, when all you really wanted to do is use it, um, it'll confuse you more um, about how you're kind of working around things. So we've got some code here. We have um, uh, a struct that we have created previously. So I don't think I called it ship internals previously, but this is where I might, I have this naming scheme I often do, where it's like there's an internal thing and there's the external visible thing. And so what this type def does is it says to us, Yes, there is a pointer to a struct, but no, you don't know what the struct is. So it's better for you not to think of this as a pointer. We're going to give you a capital letter thing. It's a, it's a large concept that you'll be dealing with. You can just think about it as that concept. So always think about this as a capital S ship, and we'll deal with the internals on the other side of this H file. And it's like, okay, you get a ship if you call create on the ship. If you free the ship, it disappears. Um, if you want to send the ship off on a voyage you would you would give a ship type and i just used even like you can get away with it sometimes you use the same name because you use a lowercase letter for an individual ship and the uppercase letter for the concept of the ship which is the type and i send the ship off on a voyage of discovery that takes a certain number of years i don't know what happens here when i call this function i assume that somewhere in the back end is some something that um that, that sets up what actually happened on those voyages and what, you know. So I don't, I don't have the details, but I could still send a ship on this voyage without knowing exactly what it is the ship is going to do. Um, what's that say? Oh, someone was talking about a Hall of Fame. Yeah, we used to try to do Hall of Fame things in the assignments where people would do interesting things that are over and above what's in the assignment itself. Uh, and then we'd put them up on a website and, and show the interesting things people had done. Uh, that was eating up way too much of my tutor's time to actually organize the Hall of Fame and stuff. We only did it once out of the seven iterations that we've done 1511. So that's why it's not there anymore. Okay, so here's my ship. And someone said ship, 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 ship. So there's lots of ship here. So, but we have functions to create and destroy. And as we saw when we did this with stacks, we could do more functions. Um, really, you want to look at a good example of an abstract data type. You look at your assignment and how many functions are in that and how how much that you can kind of do with it. 
And the implementation behind it, I squished this all in here to fit, is when we create a ship, um, it has a name, and um, you'd malloc it, and again, uh, this is the same kind of thing where we've got the pointer, but you see we didn't even have, need to call it a pointer this time because we had a name for it, which is the capital S ship, um, is the size of this particular struct. Um, so it's the same kind of thing where you have the size of it and the pointer to it, but it's just slightly different this time because we've used the type def. Um, so we create it, we can free it. I mean, really, we hardly needed this function, but we have this function anyway because from this end, at this level, we don't know what the details are in the ship. I could have put more details in the ship and then it would have been more complicated to free it. So maybe if the ship had a shuttle, which was another ship, and then it's a link list that's not just a ship, then we have to be more careful about just freeing it. So this function is still valid to have, even though it's a one-liner here. If we set off on this voyage of discovery, um, we have this, um, oh wait, this isn't legal code. It's not returning the ship. It's supposed to return the ship. Also, it's not going to fit on the slide now. I'm still going to put that in though. Um, so we don't fit on the slide anymore, but that's okay. The idea is that the implementation file, and this is going to be a separate C file, is going to do all the work behind those functions and make sure those functions work. Um, Skiro is asking, why is it character star and not character space star? I think that's, oop, <laughs> hang on a second. Um, it's basically because I slipped up. So I think I've said before that um, sometimes I slip, slip up and you know, like you get that kind of thing where someone's speaking, someone has a native language. Like the first language that I learned was English. But when I try to speak in other languages, um, I'm gonna end up making mistakes and, and saying things that are kind of like the way an English speaker would say them. I just did a C++ thing where C++ often puts the star on the on the type, not on the variable itself. Um, there are actually differences. There, there, there are things uh, Shrey might talk about there where it actually kind of, um, it sort of makes a difference. Like, I do understand people thinking that the, the pointer makes more sense on the left, um, but there's actually ways that you do it that, that make that actually different. Um, see if someone can, can put the example in there in text while I talk about other things, because it is actually a thing. Um, there's a reason why it's there. Okay, so we have... This is... I always put these memes in here. These are both the same person, I think, because someone had a field day um, when I left the H off something when I was including um, a file in another file. So we're going to talk about the structure of the multi-file projects here as well, but this is the point where I left the .h off uh, the standard input output library once, and... Um, this is what chat looked like that day. I think it was pretty funny. Ah, uh, hello, Koi. You are... Yes, both of these memes are yours. <laughs> I think that was a funny thing, is that you um, had these memes in the forum before the lecture had finished. So obviously you were paying a lot of attention during the lecture that day. <laughs> okay, so abstract data types like this, we can have a main file that also includes the header file. So this one has the H in it. And there's a difference between how we include standard libraries and how we include um, our own created libraries. When we create a library, we do the double quotes, which is like, this is a literal file that is somewhere where we compile the other files. Um, if we do the angle brackets, we say to the compiler, now this is a standard file, stuff you should know about. Um, so can you grab it from your collection of, of the standard library? Um, Okay, so here we have the symbol main, which is going to create a ship. This time it's called the Enterprise, and it's going to go on a voyage um, that lasts for five years. So my ship is the Enterprise, and my ship goes on a five-year voyage. Um, so you can see I've crossed... Well, I don't know if you... It depends how much people are into the, uh, the Star Wars versus Star Trek universe. So I've crossed over into the Star Trek universe here. But I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with my... Um, uh, my what's my call it, uh, my spaceship things. So yeah, I can use the functions without knowing what's in them, but I know that somewhere they've been implemented. Um, did I talk about compiling? I didn't necessarily talk about compiling here, but we, we do want to make sure that when we're compiling these files, we will compile all of the C files. We don't have to compile any of the H files because anytime the H files are used, they're going to be included 
in the C files themselves. So there's a slight difference between how we use the headers and the implementation files. Um, we also looked at recursion. Um, this is a little bit weird because I didn't use Tom's slides for this, I used my slides. So they're, they're slightly different, but I think the concept should still be the same. So recursion is when we use functions to call themselves. And the interesting thing about a function calling themselves is every time a function calls itself, it will add a new copy of itself to the program call stack. So we looked at the call stack, which is like, okay, we're gonna main function and we put something on top of it, which is a function that we call. And then that function calls another function that goes on top and it's a stack. So only the thing on the top can be used at any point in time. So only the thing on the top of the stack will have its code run. And then when it finishes, it goes to the next thing down on the stack. And when that finishes, it goes back to the next thing down on the stack. So. When we do recursion, what we do is we have functions calling themselves. Um, and that is like what we call the recursive case of it continuing to call itself. But at some point, um, these functions, because they're not all going to be calling themselves on exactly the same information, they're not going to have the same input. Eventually, one of these functions will hit a point where it's like, oh, I stop here. And then it'll return and it'll return through all of those functions back down to the main again. Um, so I had an example here of reverse printing a list where it's like, if the list is empty, we're going to stop and not do anything. So that's where we return. But if there are elements in the list, what we're going to do is we're going to print out whatever else is in the list. Then we're going to print out our own name and then we're going to put a new line. So what it is, what we're doing is we're going to go backwards through a, a, a list and the way that we can see this working, I had a, um, uh, um, a, a, a way of kind of visualizing the steps that this takes. So the first thing is the function gets called and it checks for the stopping case. If it's not in the stopping case, what it does is it calls itself again. So it calls another version of itself to run and then it prints stuff out um, and then it ends. So I had this, um, uh, this way of looking at it where I can have three function calls of the same um, of the same function, but they're all separate. So one of them says, check if we're stopping. So we're not stopping, so we didn't return. So otherwise, if we're not stopping, we call the function again. And sorry, my phone is buzzing on the table. Um, so we call the function again, and, and what it will do is um, it'll call the function on another piece of the data of that we're working on. And then this is that function call. And it checks if we're stopping, we're not necessarily stopping, so otherwise it calls the function again. And then this one does this, and maybe this one stops. So this one doesn't call the function again, so this one stops here, and then it returns. And when it returns, it goes to this one that says, print out the current head of the list, and that's the list that this one had, and then this will return to this one, and then we'll print out its head of the list. So we get this kind of, um, um, this kind of way that this function was halfway through when it called this function, which was halfway through when it called this function. But then when this one returns, it goes back to this function, then finishes what it's doing, then back to this one that finishes what it's doing. And so what we do is like, we can actually go through a list and end up having this execution of printing stuff out here happen in reverse order, because this one happens first, then this one, then this one. So interesting things that we can do with recursion. That's a really simple example of reversing a list. Um, Tom was doing finding the maximum of the list and you could do that same kind of thing where you find the maximum there and then you use that to change what happens with this one and this one then is the combination of these two that changes what happens with this one. So once you've gone in and collected all the information then you come back out and you use that information to build things up again. So interesting kind of way of thinking. And someone was thinking, um, I think someone asked ages ago in chat um, whether recursion would be in the exam and that's a very very interesting question because the answer is yes and no <laughs> because recursion's in the exam if you want to use it um, but recursion is not required in the exam and technically I don't know if this is 100% true but technically anything that you can do with recursion you can do without recursion and technically anything that you can do with what we call procedural programming you can also do with recursion so uh, it's in it if you want it to be, um, but you can code whichever way you feel comfortable with. Um, if we're doing something like 
I guess if we're doing something like the either re reversing of a link list or something where you want to go through a link list in in reverse order, then recursion might be uh, a cleaner way of doing it. We haven't yet seen enough of of the programming world to see very many examples of where recursion is, you know, strictly a superior way of doing things than going straightforwardly through something. Um, I guarantee if you continue much further in computing, you will see this stuff. Um, but for the moment, it's more... I'd say re recursion's kind of an introductory thing where we're not really going to be assessing it that much or anything, but it's more of like, here, check this thing out. Later on, this is going to be like super important to you, but like for now, don't worry too much. If you get the idea, that's good. If you don't get the idea, that's fine. Um, you will have time to learn it later. So no one's expecting you to be a master of recursion in COM1511. We didn't really spend enough time on it for that. Okay, so random memes that people threw in that I, I wanted to put in here anyway. Um, I want to say, yes, so now we're programming. Now we're able to do things. <laughs> I love this one here. It's like, you type 10 lines of code and it works first time it runs. I see no god up here, other than me. <laughs> I don't know how that cat got up there, but I think that's the top of a telegraph pole. Um, and this was a funny one, just about um, us and testing. And I think that I put this one actually in the previous lecture as well. Um, but I'd forgotten that I put it there, so I checked it in here as well. So what I want to say is, now we have reached a certain point. Yeah. Now we have reached a point in... Um, in our programming careers and for some people i i hope that this is a fundamental shift in where you are so you're now a programmer in a way that you probably wouldn't have called yourself a programmer previously but now you can look at yourself and go i can make computers do things i have learnt the languages to talk to computers and i've well, well one language but you know the idea and i've learned how to solve problems with computers i've got this stuff going now i have a decent idea about what's going on and so we are we are reaching the end of the first step in our journey you've basically finished the the tutorial level of the game of computer programming that you're going to be playing for i don't know how many years of your life um, but I hope that people are now at a point where they're like, I, I actually can start doing this. So I want to talk about maybe thinking about what, where we're at and where we go from here. So what I'm going to say is like, there's so much that you can do now. Um, and this is going to be different for each of us. Some of us are going to learn some things more than other things. And it's like, we've, we've hit a point where we can do so much, but there is so much more. <laughs> So as I said before, I've said this to people that like the field of computing has more stuff than anyone can learn. You can spend your entire life on it and you will not be able to learn at all. Um, we can even get to the point where there are so many research papers being published in computing. So every time a research paper is published, it means someone has done something that no one has ever done before in computing. That's what research is, finding out new things that haven't been done before. And so that's the interesting thing is like there's so much being published that no one could even read it all in a lifetime, let alone learn what everyone else is doing. So what we've got now is a field opening up to you that is... Um, it's always going to give you something that you can learn about. There's so many things to, to delve into. And some of these things are going to be like, you could go like deep. You could go this, this kind of like, what I call the downwards level of programming. You could be like, I don't care about these abstract theories and stuff like that. I want to place things in memory in the exact best positions so that everything works a, a tiny bit faster. And it's like, that's a beautiful level of programming. It's so pure. You know, it's you and the machine and like, you're right there with it. Or you can go the other direction, or you consider it to be higher level program. You just go, oh, you know what? I don't think that the computers are very important in this whole situation. I don't think the computers are really part of what's going on here. I want to look at abstract logical concepts. And I want to think about the idea of like, can we create a perfect algorithm for this particular purpose? And it's like, uh, I'm not going to code it. I don't, I don't need to code. I'm going to be there with a whiteboard and all these mathematical symbols. And that's also part of computing, you know? Or what I want to do is I want to say, I think that one of the biggest problems in computing in the world is like, what is the link between humans and computers? 
Like, why are we using a hundred year old typewriter setup to input information to our computers? Because that's what a keyboard is. It's literally a hundred years old. It's probably even older than that. I can't remember when typewriters were first invented, but we, we literally have not updated that technology. Like, we're just pressing keys still, like monkeys at a typewriter. <laughs> you know, like, the, the idea that that is still our primary form of communication with these amazingly fast machines, we slow them down to a crawl by the way we type in. Why haven't we done something better? You know, and so that is an entire field there for people working on it and then delves into like human psychology and stuff like that so we we hit this point now and we're at this and you now start to have these options opening up to you where you decide where you want to go you decide how much of your life you want to spend on something like for me i spent um i spent several years on just game playing artificial intelligence you know stuff that was not necessarily um going to be used right then and there for for things um that were like gonna like change the world or anything but then they will be shifting into that kind of thing because you go from game playing ai to like you know just kind of weird environment ai changing environments because that's what games are right and so that kind of thing is now becoming the the ai of the future and stuff and so it's been interesting to watch that um you could spend years just thinking about how to make um secure systems because I think one of the big problems that's coming up in the near future is that, like, everything is digital, so digital theft becomes a real thing and an actual crime. And so, like, I mean, it has been for a while, but you could spend your entire life just looking at how to secure systems against um, uh, just uh, uh, illegal access and stuff like that. So, like, all of these things could occupy your entire career if you want to. Um, so what I'm going to say is, like, yeah, it's all open now. There's so much stuff that you can do. But what I want to remind you of is one of the things that I consider to be one of the most important and also one of the things that's going to be important for you and the people around you is to give a shit about what's happening. Yeah. So I think that is like one of the most important things. Care about what's happening to you. Care about what's happening to the world around you. Care about what's happening to your people and things like that. Because... If we're given the power to shift the way the technology works, if we're given the power to shift the way the world is going to be shaped based on the computing technology that works on it, then if we don't care about things, and we don't care about people, and we don't care about the world, then we're going to make some stuff that hurts people, and that's probably not where we want to be. I don't know, maybe it's where you want to be, but I I would love to be able to teach you that, 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 um, that, that, that giving a shit about what happens um, is very important. Um, so what I want to say is um, keep looking for things that you love doing. Keep looking for things that fulfill you. Work on them. Um, and, and please let me know um, in the distant future when you, when you hit the jackpot and your startup gets acquired by Google for billions of dollars and you're like, I remember why. I started doing this. I remember why I wanted to do this. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to be able to get something back where someone says, you know, I still remember Comp 1511 where I knew nothing of what was going on. I was confused as all hell, but you told me to go look for things that were interesting and look for things that I wanted to do, and I got there in the end. I would love to hear from you um, when that happens. So that's it. Thank you very much um, for taking part in Comp 1511. Um, I hope you have a good time with whatever you do in the future in computing. This isn't necessarily goodbye. I'm sure I will see some of you again. Um, I'm also going to be just helping you out with study over the next week. I will be around supporting the exam as well and stuff like that. But um, this course ends here. Um, and this is the end of the final lecture. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's nearly, it's actually a much bigger goodbye than it is normally for me, because normally I would now immediately start rolling into preparing the next term of 1511, but I'm actually not even going to be doing this for another year now. So um, this is this is a big one. So this is me doing seven of these in a row and then stopping. So um, yeah, um, thank you for being the largest class we've ever taken for 1511, but it's also been a really, really interesting term. Um, so yeah, thank you all. I was gonna... One sec, I'm gonna find Chicken so she can say bye as well. Chicky.
<laughs> she was napping on the couch, so she's probably a little bit like just like blah now. But goodbye from chicken. Thank you all. And good luck in the exam. I will see you before the exam finishes anyway, because I'll see you for like one or two study sessions. I'll organize a, a study stream um, uh, next week. Uh, and also I think I'll organize something for, for just like sort of regular streaming and stuff afterwards. So thank you everyone. Thank you for all the lovely comments uh, that you're leaving in chat at the moment. It's very, very nice of you. Um, but I hope that more than anything else, um, you've got some inspiration to want to continue with what you're doing. Or if you don't have that, that's fine as well. If you, if you know that like, this was fun, this was enough computing and I'm not going to do any more. That's, that's all right as well. You know, like, I just hope that, that, um, what everyone gets is a, like a, a good opportunity to kind of find something they want to do with their time. Also, we like totally smashed that speed run. I think I went a little too fast through some of it, <laughs> but when I realized I was going too fast, I slowed it down and showed a lot of useful things. All right. We're gonna wrap it up early there. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bother doing questions or anything now because I think any questions from here on are going to be study related questions and stuff. And I think that people potentially want to spend the next two hours finishing off their assignment. It is due at 8 p.m. Right? This is from the majority of the class. I think a lot of people who had file issues and stuff. It's not due till Monday, so they've got all weekend to work on it. Um, Someone said, can I come and visit Chicken when I come to Sydney? I don't think so. Chicken's very, very anxious. She doesn't actually, um, uh, she doesn't actually really like people. <laughs> she only likes me. <laughs> um, someone was asking why the assignment is due at 8pm and not 12. We used to have stuff due at midnight, um, but we're, we're trying to shift towards the idea that we are pushing you towards um the idea that deadlines should be human based you know and so if we have stuff due at midnight then what we do is we're kind of convincing people to submit stuff when they're very very tired and they've worked longer hours than they should in a day so what we do is we go all right we understand that some people work during the daytimes so we'll make it in the evening but we're not going to make it so late in the evening that um it pushes people to to kind of not get healthy sleep so for example like because you can go a few hours over a deadline and still not have like a significant late penalty and if you do that then you're working at like 4 a.m and you actually got a pretty good chance if you submit something that you've worked all day and you haven't slept through to 4 a.m and you submit it then you've actually got a chance of losing more marks than gaining them in that time so it's that kind of thing we're trying to give people um a shift towards a um a, a working lifestyle that cares about its workers rather than a working lifestyle that cares about like you know puts the company above the workers in a sense or just like the the deadline's more important than your well-being so that's the that's the kind of shift um oh someone's asking me about toby walsh toby's like a, a, a like probably like one of the most eminent ai researchers in australia he's a good guy as well i've met him a few times um uh he um you're asking if toby teaches ai for undergrad students i don't know because I know that most of his work is very, very busy with research, but I know that a lot of the people at Data61, which is where he works, will occasionally take some small courses um, to pass on some useful info. So there might be an advanced AI course or something with him, but I'm not sure. Um, I know that some of the other people from Data61 come in, like Carol Morgan. You may notice I put a, a video up from Carol in week six, which is about using the comments to write the code. And you can see how I use his techniques a lot when I'm coding. Um, so there's a, there's a bit here and there, but I'm not sure exactly. Toby's a bit of a celebrity nowadays, I think, because he's on the TV for lots of things. All right. We're five minutes early. This is the first early mark I've ever given you for Comp 1511. Obviously going to be the last. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, and I hope it's been worth it. <laughs> I know that it takes a lot of time. I know it takes a lot out of your brain to have to try to learn to to, to talk to digital machines instead of talking to humans. And so it's not, um, it's not the thing that's the most intuitive for everyone. So... Um, I hope you've gotten something out of it nonetheless. 
Alrighty. See you all. I will see you next week. I'm going to come along to the study session and I'll organize some kind of um, revision live stream as well. Um, and in the weeks following that, I will probably start up some kind of regular streaming thing to, to make sure that I'm still keeping in contact with students during the time that I'm not lecturing. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you all. <laughs>